you're talking about me as a parent shaping my child's brain forever and ever. That's scary. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> let's make it in a less scary format. Okay, let's um, do that. The brain is constantly changing throughout the lifespan. There's always room to grow new circuits as you get older. But a parent has this wonderful opportunity as the first teacher, because all teachers can do this, but when the circuits of kindness and resilience are first growing is in the first three or four years of life. And so my intimate connection with you on a daily basis, you come home from school, before you go to school, you're home as a baby, all these ways that our communication is literally going to shape the circuits of regulation that allow kindness and resilience to develop based on what I do. Now, mm. it sounds like it's a lot of pressure. It's more like an opportunity. Parents give birth to kids as a privilege that we then share their lives with them, but we can shape the way their brain is growing. And I think what you said in there that makes me less anxious. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I was really nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Is that you don't have to get a PhD in shaping a child's brain. You're talking no. about everyday things that we do with a slightly different way of looking at our children and our children's behavior. It, and yeah. that's what we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about as examples of that. But Excellent. that's really what you're talking about. Yeah. And the way Tina, Bryce, and I tried to say that is, you know, the moments that are sometimes most challenging as a parent, where we feel overwhelmed and burdened and confused, are actually the very moments you can see as opportunities to do something that we haven't mentioned, but we can get into it, but it's called integration. You know, and, and so through the work I've done over the last 20 years, it's been to try to define what the mind is, and believe it or not, in the field of psychology and the field of attachment and the field of psychiatry and the field of mental health, the field of education, the field of philosophy even, there is no definition of the mind. There's none. So in the work I do, it's in a field called interpersonal neurobiology. We combine all the sciences together, and we offer a definition of the mind. And then it lets parents, with that definition, realize that the mind is both in relationships and in the body. And by really locating the mind in these two places, it really empowers parents to say, I want my mind of my child, the mind of my child, to be healthy and strong and resilient and kind. Those are mental mm -hmm. functions. So I know I have to use my relationship to actually shape the brain, and then you can learn about these basics of the brain. So these moments that seem the most challenging, instead of perceiving them as a burden, you reframe them and you say, okay, this is a challenging moment, but how do I use, and that's why we did the book, and the book has cartoons and all this kind of stuff. You know, we made it really accessible so parents can make the brain something that they can really understand because to really deeply understand the mind you really need to understand both the brain and relationships. But you suggest that even children, you, you try to help children understand what's happening in their brain when yeah, things are happening. Absolutely. I mean, we, we'll, we, we'll have, exactly we have sections in, in the book where, and we already have very young kids, as young as two and a half, as a, our youngest reader, who are actually going over the pictures of the brain. Because if you think about it, why shouldn't every citizen on this planet know about how their brain works? Because when you know how your brain works, you actually can change the way it works. This is just the truth of it. So, so what we did was we just said, okay, we're having this be about parents know about the child's brain and have the child learn about her own brain we'll too. We'll go through some examples yeah. of that. You know, the, other, the only other time that we've, in the last few years, talked about parents affecting the brain has been through videos like Baby Einstein, where mm -hmm. it's been about using things to make your child stand out and yeah. learn the alphabet. So is this kind of baby Einstein for mm. the heart? No. <laughs> First of all, uh, a colleague of mine, I mean, Andrew Meltzoff and Patricia Kuehl did a study of the baby Einstein tapes, you probably know this, in Seattle. And this is why there was a multi-million law dollar lawsuit against Disney because they bought baby Einstein and they showed that if you had your baby doing baby Einstein tapes, they actually did worse at language acquisition. Now, so A, it doesn't work. So <laughs> A, it doesn't work, and B, your child will actually be less good at what you were hoping mm. and buying the product to make it good, and in fact, what the product said. Now, why was that the case? Well, when you talk to Andy and Pat, what they say is, it isn't that there was something bad about these tapes. 
It's that when parents stick kids in front of a screen, they're taking time away from a relationship. And there are a lot of other studies just to support their point of view that learning happens in relationships. Relationships give you a feeling of trust. Relationships inspire you. Relationships activate a part of the brain that's very much aligned with the motivational circuits, so you feel very motivated. You know, a friend of mine did a study, you know, they say you can't learn a foreign language after adolescence, right? That's generally true. And a friend of mine wrote a whole book, uh, John Schumann, showing that there was a subset of adults who could learn a foreign language in adulthood. And all of them had one thing in common. What? They were in love with someone who spoke that language. <laughs> Very motivated. <laughs> and, and that was the secret. That's the secret. That's the secret. <laughs> you yeah. want to learn French? I'm trying to still learn uh, all sorts of things. But no, that, that's... Uh, <laughs> That's, so, that, so that's the issue. So, yeah. so, the thing, so this is not baby Einstein. In a way, this is the opposite of baby Einstein. This is saying human beings, I, I think you know, in terms of where we're at in our culture, we're at this very funny moment where rigorous science abandoned the mind. Even the field of psychology abandoned the mind, really. The field of psychiatry, my field, abandoned the mind. It's just a strange thing. I think we're at a moment of huge change in just bringing the rigor of science into the reality that the mind is not the same as the activity of the brain, no matter what neuroscientists say, and that the mind is both embodied, so the nervous system is really important, but it's not just up in the head. Um, it's throughout the whole body, and it's relational. And that way, if you're interested in culture or cultural change, whether it's in a school, like a medical school or a primary school or any kind of school, or you're interested in cultural change in our society, you see, this title, Building the Neural Circuits for Resilience and Kindness, is absolutely about parenting, but it's equally about our culture. Hmm. It's about the whole field of education. Right? You can just change the first part and, you know, like surviving in the 21st century or living in the 21st century or something like that. Because you can make an argument that the future of the human species is dependent on doing these things. It's absolutely dependent on looking at the idea that we can use intentionality to change the pathway of cultural evolution on this planet. And all you have to do is read the newspaper or you know, get on the internet and you see how serious this is. Now the great news is we are incredibly creative creatures and we can do this. And there's no better place to start than in parenting. And one of the key words that you've mentioned already, but it's going to continue to come up tonight, is this word integration. Yes. So what is it, and why do we want it, and what do we look like when we have it? You can come up with a proposal that health and well-being are based in a fundamental shared mechanism called integration. Integration is where you have separate aspects of a system, let's say the system of this stage, there's Maria, there's me. For us to be integrated, we have to do two things. We have to differentiate from each other, that is, Maria as a unit of the system is gonna become specialized, different, she has a different history, a different thing she does, she has different talents, different abilities, different knowledge, from me, and I differentiate from her. And so the first step is we honor each other's differences. But to be an integrated system here on the stage, we have to then link with each other in communication that's compassionate and kind and caring. So for a relationship that's integrated, you have what's called integrative communication, which is basically, by the way, a summary of the entire field of attachment research in one sentence. Secure attachment is based on integrative communication, honoring differences, promoting linkages. That's the whole thing, whether your kid is a baby or a teenager or an adult at home. Okay, so, so that's about relationships. In the body, you can look at the same thing. When the nervous system, for example, is integrated, you have the left and right different from each other, but then they're linked. The higher parts and lower parts are differentiated, but then they're linked. You can go through the whole panoply of the way the nervous system functions. Integration in the nervous system is called neural integration, and when it works well, you're having balance and coordination of the processes because they're differentiated and linked. So the key element is that integration is not the same as a smoothie. It's more like a fruit salad. Seriously. People often say, well, 
stick something in a blender and it's integrated. I understand they think blended and integrated are synonyms. They're not at all. Integration, you have to, by definition, maintain the differentiated elements. You don't put them in a grinder, blend them up like a smoothie. It's not homogeneous. It's heterogeneous. So this is where you get the phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So back in the early 90s when this started occurring to me, I started looking into the science of integration. And the only place you see it talked about, even though it's not talked about as a term, is in mathematics. And then you can extend it to physics and all these other things. And basically, here's the way it works. When systems are open and capable of chaotic behavior, they are called complex systems. And complex systems have something called an emergent property. An emergent property means there's no Microsoft that's programming something, but it's actually arising from how things happen in a system. Mm. And this property of complex systems is called self-organization. So you have this emergent property called self-organization where it turns back and regulates that from which it arose. Now, there's a lot of weird looks in the face. We don't usually talk in this kind of depth. We don't talk at all like this in the book. But the bottom line is for you, if you want to know the science of it, there's a deep science to this. Here's the take home message. When you're integrated, you're in harmony. Picture a choir coming up here. The choir singers each decide to sing how? If they're going to be integrated, how would they sing? In harmony. In harmony because they're singing the same song, that's the language, but they're creating intervals, these, these distances, so they're differentiated but linked. If we had this choir up here and we said, okay, all of you plug your ears really, really tightly and just belt out the same sound for like half an hour, would they be differentiated? No. Maybe. No, I'm sorry, I'm giving this wrong. Their, their, their ears are open, they're bringing, singing out the same, the same sound the same way. Are they differentiated? No, they're singing the same note, mm -hmm. same ah, like that. Are they um, linked? Yes, but are they integrated? No. no. In this case, they get rigid. It's rigidity is one way away from integration. The other is if we have them plug their ears, sing whatever song they want, they belt out the song, and what would it sound like? Chaos. Chaos. It would be cacophony, right? So these are the two extremes away from, from harmony of integration is chaos or rigidity. The bottom line is if you think about your relationship with your children, about your family life, let's start there. When families are having challenging moments, there's chaos or there's rigidity, which means integration is impaired. Then what you do is you look for what aspect of the life of your child is not being differentiated and linked, mm -hmm. and then you make an intervention as a parent because you know about this secret in the sauce, and then you create integration where integration wasn't there, and the rigidity and the chaos go away, and harmony unfolds. People get along, they're flexible, there's a sense of vitality. So in your book it looks like on, a boat is going down a river, and one side of the river is very rigid, and the other side is very chaotic, and you want to kind of stay in the middle, but occasionally yeah, you'll you, bump you, you up like right. that. Yeah, exactly. So let's do, start doing some examples, because this in, idea of integration, to really understand it and how we apply it with our children, and in a lot of relationships, actually, I found yeah. when I was reading it. Um, so one of the things is to integrate the left side of the brain with the right side of the brain. So yes. explain to me why we want to do that and examples, maybe one example of how we might do that in everyday life with our children. Sure. So, so let's just uh, underscore something. This whole approach is based on the idea that parents can be empowered by realizing that when they have knowledge about this and the skills on how to promote integration, so detect when it's not mm -hmm. going well, and do something about it, lots of stuff changes. What's interesting <laughs> yes. about that is that often you see uh, a child will walk down the street and they'll stumble and fall because they haven't learned to walk yet. Mm -hmm. And you would never see a, you would rarely see a parent give that child hack. Stand yeah. up, you can't walk yet, get it together. But when a child in Safeway loses it at the till, you see them getting heck all the time yeah, because yeah. we as parents don't understand what you're saying, which is that their brain isn't developed yet. In the same way as they can't walk yet, their brain isn't developed. And right. the empowering part that you're talking about is I, as a parent, actually can do something in that moment to help that child's brain know how to behave in safe way next time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so, so here's, the, here's the secret. As a parent, let's say you're my daughter and I'm your father. And, um, and I'm accepting that. You notice a pattern emerging? <laughs> emerging. <laughs> we can, well, we'll reverse this. Okay, now. okay, good. So, so here's what I need to realize that communication 
is all about how you send energy and information to someone. Always. That's all communication is. So I know I don't need a scalpel. I don't need fancy tools. I don't have to have any baby Einstein tapes. I need my relationship, which is basically based on my communication. And that's going to affect... Yeah. So now, just, just to under... You need, I mean, I'm only sharing this with you. We didn't put all this in the book because I always think, why does someone come here when they could just read a book at home by a nice fire, the rain, it's raining, you just stay at home. So, so I'm giving you a little more of the details that a publisher would always you know, remove that and say you're going to intimidate people, but we can chat about it because we have a question and answer period. So here's how it goes. And you need to understand where this whole model comes from, you know, which we also didn't put in the book because we thought parents didn't really have much interest in that. But I assume you have an interest in it, I hope. <laughs> so here's the here's story. How I communicate with my daughter is going to go in through, how is, how is Maria, my daughter, going to get the energy I send to her? Her senses. She will see me. She will hear me. If I'm touching her, she'll feel me. She can smell me. She can taste me. All these things, all the five senses, right? So energy and information literally are received by the senses. Now, we need to know that as parents. So it isn't just you know, what we say. So I can say, um, you want to give me a problem and I'll do a left-right brain thing on it? I ha None of my friends will play with me at school anymore. They're there were three of us, and two of them are playing together, and they won't let me play with them. Okay, excellent. So she comes home from school. How old are you? Seven or something? I am eight. Eight, okay. <laughs> Why did I know Maria would do that? <laughs> Seven's a little young. You notice yeah, she didn't even want to stand up. <laughs> but I am, aren't I? You are, I'm yes. I'm a very yes. obedient person. No, I wouldn't call you obedient. <laughs> I wouldn't either. <laughs> no, right. Okay, that's Flexible, me. flexible. Yes. Adaptable. Adaptable, mm. yes. Okay, so now at that moment, um, what did my daughter do for me? What did she do? She sent me energy and information. What was the information all about? Rejection, exactly. So it's about her inner experience, her subjective experience of feeling rejected. Now, because I've read Whole Brain Child, I know, <laughs> I know that the feeling of connectedness, of relatedness, has a dominance actually in her right hemisphere. I also know, because I've read the book, that the signals that come up from her body, which include the signals from her heart, where we do literally have a, a brain around the heart. I don't know if you know that. You have a heart brain, as well as an intestinal brain. And that is, in part, what processes our sense of rejection. And it's going to go up into her right brain, this right brain, over here. And I know that the, the experience she's having now is she's being flooded with a sense of rejection, which is right dominant, a feeling in her body of sadness, right dominant. And all that stuff is a raw right hemisphere response. If you want to call it an emotional response, that's fine. There's emotions on both sides of the brain. My key move as a parent is to connect with Maria. Now, because I'm an adult and I've passed through the school system, I have a hugely developed left hemisphere. <laughs> it's just true. And the, the way to remember the left is there are all these L's. It's later to develop, whereas the right is? Really slow to develop. Earlier. <laughs> <laughs> the right is earlier. OK? The left is linear, so the right is holistic. The left is logical, meaning it does what's called syllogistic reasoning, looking for cause-effect relationships, solving problems. The right just takes in things as they are, so some people would say it's visual-spatial, just the impressions of how things are. The left loves making lists, like this list I'm making right now. And the right, instead, is all about autobiographical memory. It's about stress reduction. And it have, actually is the only side of the brain that has an integrated map of the whole body only in the right side of the brain. Now, the left also is specialized in linguistics. Language with words, dominant. There's language on both sides, but it's dominant on the left. The right, in contrast, is nonverbal signals. So it's eye contact, facial expression, tone of voice, posture, gestures, timing, and intensity of response. Now, I want you to do it with me. Ready? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> come on, come on, we'll do it together. I'll show eye them contact. where the accents right, come are. <laughs> come on, come on. Eye contact. Eye contact. Say it, please. Eye contact. 
Facial expression. Facial expressions. Tone of voice. Tone of voice. Posture. Posture. Gesture. Gesture. Timing. Timing. Intensity. Intensity. Of response. Let's do it together. I'm not going to say it this time. I'm going to point, and I'll point with you, but then you say it. Are you ready? This embeds it in your synaptic connection. And why are we doing this again? So you can remember it. OK. <laughs> you, now I see why your friends reject you. Oh, Dad, that was a reptilian moment. <laughs> ready? Eye contact, facial expression, tone of voice, body, gesture. Timing and intensity. Beautiful. Intensity. Okay. Now, those nonverbal signals are how the right hemisphere sends messages out into the world about how it's feeling. Almost exclusively the right hemisphere. And if I blast a bunch of nonverbal signals like that to the, the recipient, in this case my daughter, it will be only her right hemisphere that can make sense of them and take them in. So here's the secret. That part of my brain, in this case, with that side of my brain that's going to send signals is the same side that's going to receive it in the recipient. Now, this is crucial because mm -hmm. my daughter's come to me with a very activated right hemisphere. She's been rejected by her friends. She's feeling a lot of raw stuff in her body. She feels ootsy. She doesn't feel good, basically, right? So my left brain, as a parent, could now solve a problem really fast. Well, I think you should do blah, 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 blah. Like that, whatever it is I say with my left brain. Which, one, which understandably loves her and wants to solve problems, but I'm missing the opportunity to connect. When there's a part of the brain that's very activated, I need to give signals to that part, right? So what are the ways I can give my daughter a right hemisphere connection before I might redirect her to problem solving? I could give her a hug. Right? I could give her a hug like this and say, oh, that's really hard. School can be hard sometimes. Like that. Not a bunch of words. Not a bunch. Of, the left likes to explain. The right likes to describe. That's how the right uses words. Big difference. Explanations, descriptions. So I just give her a hug. I say, that must be really hard. Or being a kid is really hard sometimes. It's really hard. It's really hard. <laughs> now, what have I just done with my daughter? Connect. And what is the connection doing inside of her? It calms her down, exactly. There's nothing I could have said with my left brain that would have gotten her right brain to calm down. Nothing. But I can tune into her with my own right brain. Now, what that requires, of course, is I've got to know what that feels like inside of me. Also, I've got to be willing to feel the pain my daughter is mm, going through. That's a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. So if I haven't done the Parenting from the Inside Out book, <laughs> seriously, and I was rejected a lot as a kid, and rejection is so overwhelming for me. I was constantly humiliated. So now I run camps all over the place so everyone's accepted, or whatever I do, or I start something called Facebook, or whatever I start. Um, it's another lecture. I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> whatever I do, um, and I have no idea if that's true. That was just an off-hand comment. Um, whatever I do, the key thing now is I have to be open to what is. So if I have my own leftover mm -hmm. garbage or unresolved trauma, this is going to be a moment where there's going to be a real mm -hmm. rupture in my ability to soothe my daughter, which is what you see in about a third of the population. They haven't worked through their own stuff, so they can't be open to what is. So the next step, though, once you're open to what is, what do you do? You align, I align my right hemisphere. So I give her a hug. I say, you know, it's really hard being a kid. And then we're just sitting there, and at that moment, is she alone anymore? No. It's actually taking care of the fundamental issue which she was alone at school. If I just gave her a bunch of left brain problem solving immediately, I may do that in a few minutes, but if I did it at first, because the, the sequence is incredibly important mm. here. So connect, and then we're sitting there, and then she goes, but what should I do? But I said, yeah, that's a good question. Let's, let's problem solve. What do you, what do you think happened? And then now we're using our left brain to analyze what happened. She has autobiographical memory in her right. The left brain is going to use this sequence of things like what caused that rejection, and we can figure out what happened. 
And that's what we would do. So you want to first start with a right hemisphere to right hemisphere connection. And when you learn this, it actually becomes pretty natural. But when you don't know to do that, it seems almost like, why would you do that? She's talking about problems with her friends. Why would you hug her? You know, mm. you know, like that. Well, even more so, what if she's saying, I hate you. Yeah. You are the worst father in the world, and I wish that you would die. Do you really? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it, we, you'd have to give me a context for where that was happening. You're but, a, but, I'm a teenager, and you won't let me uh, go to a, a party. And Excellent. you are okay. the worst parent in the world. Yeah, great. So at that point, I'm coming at you with my right side of my brain. It's hard to right. want to hug me. No, 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 no. At that moment, I probably wouldn't hug okay. you. And you probably wouldn't want to receive a hug. Right. So either, how right? Do, is, you're, is that you're a aiming similar... it toward me. Well, there would be the same thing. There, the, the thing is inside of me, I have to feel my heart pounding when you say it. I've got to have the openness to know that's your experience. I've got to know that these are things that come and go. Uh, and I've got to be able to stay present with that. And, you know, it depends on what the context is, what my move would be. Uh, but I might want to just say, you know, that's really hard to hate your dad, isn't it? Mm. That's hard to do. That's hard to do. But it, depending on the context, that's what I would do. Solving problems is yeah, great, yeah. but not when it's done to the exclusion of just being with someone's inner subjective experience. And this is the key point you're raising. And this is about, this is really getting into the right left brain stuff. The right brain really likes to just be with what is. And that attunement between two people is one of the most important experiences of joining any of us can have ever. So you can say you're not doing anything, but actually you're doing something by just being mm -hmm. together. Right? And, and that is something a lot of people miss because they feel so anxious inside. They want to solve a problem, solve a problem. They don't realize the fundamental connection that needs to be set up is not about looking for ways of, of solving a problem. It's just about being with a reality. Now, what does that mean on a deep, deep level? And, and this is a right hemisphere, left hemisphere mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't take the time to align myself with your right hemisphere, all I'm going to do is do what the entire rest of the world does, which is in the left brain, it's always looking outward. So for example, this is going to get a little complicated with anatomy, but for a baby, a baby searches the world with the right hand, which goes straight to the left brain. Hmm. But the baby soothes herself with the left hand, hmm. which is going right to the right brain. So the way to, if you want to just get a gist of the differences, besides the idea that the left is looking at the text and the right is looking at the context and the left is like the letter of the law whereas the right is the spirit of the law. The, the right hemisphere is really about interiority. It really looks at the interior of the self and the interior of other people. It looks for the subjective side of the mind is a right brain dominant thing. The left is really all about looking outward, solving problems, sending language out figuring out what am I supposed to display to the outside world. There are things called social display rules. What am I supposed to really do to be accepted by other people? That's all left brain stuff. So in these ways, parents are so busy managing their children's doings and calendars and everything like that, that they miss this mm. opportunity for being with their child. And it's very, very sad. And the thing I'm really concerned about is when you add busy parenting that are focused on doing and calendars and managing behavior, where they're not actually being with the mind of the child. Then you launch kids into schools, which are unbelievably pressured to get kids ready for this incredibly competitive, me, 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 do better, 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 better. Then they're on the internet, which is constantly an externally focused set of stimuli. We're raising a generation that actually isn't developing the skills of looking inward, which is where kindness comes from. And it's where resilience mm -hmm. comes from. It's where the permission to know there's a vulnerable part of myself that has a longing that's not met, like you just told me there. The way we really allow that vulnerability to be present, so for kindness to be there, is to actually be able to look inward at ourselves and look inward at others. So at a very, very basic level, this is how we see the mind. I call it mind sight. And there's a way of living where you don't see the mind, and there's a way of living where you do. And everything in modern culture is pushing us to not look at the mind. But you're offering such a simple solution. It's, it doesn't cost any money. Zero. 
and, and for all kinds of reasons that you just described, we're not doing it. The cultural pressure is not to sit quietly and draw with each other and look into each other's faces. And right. yet in that scenario that you talked about where the child is upset and you attend to the right side of the brain by, by touching them, connecting with them emotionally. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you're able, shortly after that, to start to problem solve. Is that because something's actually happening in their brain? Sure, let me give you an example. Let's go, should we go back to the example where you feel rejected? Sure. So, so there are studies that everybody should know about that I summarize with the phrase, name it to tame it. So if, if you're really agitated, you're frightened of being rejected again, or you're really upset with what happened, or you're angry or whatever, in Maria's right brain, I can tell you there's, in addition to right and left, there's, now ex please excuse these incredibly simplistic statements, but there's an upstairs brain and a downstairs brain. Now I'm fine with that for this parenting book, but believe me, my, you know, my other foot is in science, and the scientists would see that and go, what? But the fact is, there's a cortical rim where a lot of this higher stuff goes on, and there's everything below the cortex. So if you take your thumb and put it in the middle of your fingers and put your hands over the top, give this a try. Um, this would be in my brain like this, see? And so this would be the cortex where you do all your thinking and planning and all that kind of stuff. If you lift up your cortex, you have everything below the cortex, which we call the downstairs brain. So it's reasonable. Downstairs is just a substitute for the word subcortical which freaks parents out, so downstairs. <laughs> and it's the, the upstairs brain is the cortex, okay? So you lift up your upstairs brain, you go to the, your downstairs brain, that's the subcortex. It's the limbic area and it's the brain stem. These are very ancient circuits responsible for things like emotion and motivation and fight, flight, freeze reaction and your arousal states whether you're awake or asleep, stuff like that. So what happens at that moment is if we did a scan on your brain, we would say that your right amygdala in your limbic area and your downstairs brain. Downstairs brain. Mm -hmm. The downstairs brain would be super active. Ch -ch 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 -ch. I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. And studies show that if you have this kind of presence and, uh, uh, of mind, I can get Maria's left brain to name the feeling from the downstairs brain. And you can show that she will squirt soothing Wow. neurotransmitters down to her right limbic area, right downstairs brain, and calm it hmm. down. Okay, so, you know, we quickly summarized that entire set of studies with name it to tame it. I mean, so that's all parents need to know. In the book, we didn't put any of this stuff, but everything is backed up by science, believe me. So what does that look like? Um, I, I come to you so, and I have a problem. What do you so here's what it looks like. So let's say you're agitated about being rejected by your friends. So I give you the hug. All I'm doing at that moment, I'm not naming anything. Mm. You don't jump to that. Yeah. First it's connect and then redirect. So that's, you know, we have these strategies, connect and redirect. So the idea is first I connect with my right hemisphere. That helps soothe your whole system, but you're still nervous about going back to school. So then I say, well, let's talk about it. And you say, well, this happened, then she was there, and she was going to go to the party, but she didn't want to go, and then they turned away from me, they wouldn't have lunch with me. And I said, it sounds like you're really feeling a big feeling of fear that when you go to school tomorrow, no one's going to want to have lunch with you. So we're naming fear. And I thought I was angry. And maybe, maybe you were angry too. But, but it helps yeah. to have the... Right, but you have to, to actually name the, the accurate yeah. emotion. Yeah, I, I hear that. Right? Because yeah. we could say, well, you're feeling excited to go for popsicles, yeah. but that's wrong. Yeah. Right? So it's not just yeah. naming anything. And when you name it, it registers you know? as true. That's what I'm getting at. Is sometimes we think we're angry, but in fact we're sad or we're right. fearful. So, so yeah. by you saying fear, it might in fact... That would calm yeah. Your, yeah. your downstairs brain. Yeah. Right. So at that moment, then we're using... First, connecting with the right hemisphere, it helps the system get stabilized. You don't feel alone. Mm -hmm. The next step is to name it to tame it. So I'm going to now help you with my left brain because I'm going to use both my hemispheres together and go, gosh, I wonder what my daughter's really feeling here. And I'm not going to tell you what you're feeling, but I would say something like, I wonder if you're feeling scared. And then in Maria's brain, the whole system calms down. Mm -hmm. The upstairs brain can control what's happening in the downstairs. That's why it's over top of it. Like that's that. why it's over top of it. That's right. Yes, that's the reason it's there. 
It's actually the reason we can all sit in an auditorium like this for two and a half hours rather than just looking for berries or something. Um, so we have this cortex, right? So, so now what happens is if this thing is firing enough, this downstairs brain is firing enough, here's what happens. It fires, it fires, it fires, it fires. And pretty soon, it's going to make it so the ability of my upstairs brain to maintain the coordination and balance of the downstairs brain gets a little on the edge. And think of the experience of someone hanging off a cliff, right? You're hanging on. You're still hanging on. You're still hanging on. You're still hanging on. And you can feel yourself shaking. Hmm. But what happens when you let go? Yeah, eventually you're... When you let go, you are going. It's the same way with the upstairs brain. It holds on, it holds on, it holds on, it holds on, and there's a bunch of parents smiling, so you know what's about to happen. <laughs> this is now let's talk about our brains. It's holding on, it's holding on, it's holding mm -hmm. on, and suddenly the firing from the downstairs brain is too much. The grip is lost, and watch what happens, and this is why it happens so quickly, you guys. This now no longer is coordinating and balancing it. That's the first thing. So now this is now erupts out because it's no longer contained, which turns this way, way off, so within two, three seconds... You go from kind of being a reasonable human being to flipping your lid. <laughs> Has this happened to any of you? And let me just remind you, just because I know we probably won't talk about it, but it's worth just saying, I'm going to give you the list of the scientific things. We didn't put all this in the book. Oh, actually, we did put this in the book, but not as a list. Here are the, the nine functions that this upstairs brain part right here behind your forehead allows you to achieve. Watch what happens if I can help my daughter Maria keep her upstairs brain working well so she's coordinated and balanced, she'll have these nine. But if her downstairs brain is so agitated and I can't help her name it to tame it and I can't connect and then redirect and I can't do that stuff, she may get really agitated and she may start throwing things and have a big temper tantrum and do all sorts of stuff and like, oh my God, I have a kid with, you know, the dysregulation disorder or something like that. Mm. Mm. You know? Because it's, it's all about relationships. I mean, there are people with disorders like that for sure, but I always want to ask, what's happening in a relationship first? So here's the nine functions. Number one, if she can maintain that, and if I as a parent can maintain it, I can regulate my body. I literally have two branches of the nervous system that are the brakes and the accelerator of the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic and sympathetic branches. Anyway, basically it makes my heart rev up, and my lungs breathe faster, and my intestines churn, or it calms all that stuff down. And how you balance the brakes and accelerators is basically how you regulate your body. All happens from here down. The upstairs brain is the master controller of that. So if you lose that function, you can just be totally out of control. That's number one. Number two is the ability to tune into someone else. So at the moment Maria comes home and she's telling me about what happened at school, if I've had a bad day, or I'm really agitated, or I want this to be my perfect daughter, or I was rejected as a kid and I can't stand the feeling that my rejected child's invoking in me because I, I didn't want to think about my own rejection because I was just fired at work or I was rejected when I was a kid or whatever the issue is, and I can't stand it like that, then at that moment, I can't attune to her. This is what this area allows. This area allows you to literally tune into the internal experience of another person. Make a map in your own mind of not only the feelings that another person might be having, and that's called compassion, feeling with, but also to imagine what it's like to be in the mental life of this other person. That's called empathy. So attunement is the gateway to both those things. So it's this balance between rigidity and chaos. This is called... And that's a, again... This that's rigidity. emotional balance. This is the part of the brain we know from science allows you to achieve that. And this is the part of the brain, this whole talk is about how you develop this in your child. Okay, so that's number three. Number four is called response flexibility. Number four, if you think about this area in Maria's brain, this is the area right here that allows you to take an impulse and put a space between an impulse and an action. Right, it allows you to choose all the different possible responses you have, think about the various ones and say, you know, I think I'll choose that one. You know the marshmallow experiment? You guys all know that? Some people are not even. So let me just remind you. A, a guy studied, I think it was two or three year olds, gave them a marshmallow, said, hey, you know, if you can wait a little bit, I'm gonna come back with another marshmallow. You can have two of them. 
and then he left. And then they just filmed the kids. And then he studied them when they were like 25, 30 years of age. The kids who did not eat the marshmallow did better in every aspect of doing better in their lives. Better relationships, better work thing, better academic achievement, better everything. Better marshmallows grade. are that powerful. Marshmallows. <laughs> that's that's the, because. That's because it's important to eat two of them. That's it. <laughs> so they, what's the deal? They had response flexibility. Yeah. They could say, you know something, I'd love to eat this marshmallow, but I think I'll wait. So already at that age they had developed Already, because this, this develops at 18 months of age. This but it doesn't stop developing. It doesn't stop it. developing until 19 months. But <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, I think right. mine is still developing. <laughs> right, it develops throughout the lifespan. Yeah. But the idea is it starts developing around 18, 18 months to about uh, 24 to 36 months. Mm. Right, so they were studying these kids that had it. It's directly related to attachment experiences. Now, obviously, temperament would also influence yeah. that too. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's responsibility, but flexibility. Number five is the ability to calm fear. Literally, as I mentioned, there are these fibers that go from this upstairs brain down to the downstairs brain, the amygdala, and they squirt inhibitory peptides called GABA is one example. GAMMA, aminobutyric acid, you don't need to know that. Why am I saying it? See, this is my, I've got so many hats on. Um, anyway, it squirts a substance to the fear part of the brain that calms it down. That's how you actually overcome fear. You don't actually, it looks like you don't change your downstairs brain, which encoded the fear. You teach your upstairs brain to interpret the context as not uh, finding the downstairs brain response useful, and you tell it to chill out. And that can come through relationship. That's and that comes through saying. relationships. The study of shy kids show that kids with shyness have very intensely reacting right sided downstairs brains, at, you know, when they're very young. And the kids that are followed into their adulthood are found to go on a pathway. They either can stay really anxious and nervous and reserved, or they can overcome it almost entirely. This is the work of Jerry Kagan. And Jerry and I were just in a debate about stuff like this. That's another long story. But the bottom line is his wonderful research shows that parents who just throw their shy, what's called behavior inhibited kid, into the deep end of the pool, stay nervous the rest of their lives. And parents who overprotect their shy kid and say, oh, you never need to go in that pool. You know, never, ever, ever, don't worry, Johnny, I'll always be with you till you're <laughs> at home with me, you know. <laughs> anyway, I'm not saying that's what's no, causing they never the leave boomerang home. generation. <laughs> I don't know if that's what it is. You do have a lot of shy people in Canada, I've noticed that. Though. <laughs> It's Just a very polite. interesting finding. We don't have that many of them down in the United States. And they don't have any of them in Australia. I've noticed that. <laughs> Shy people usually don't get in jail. <laughs> it's a little, I do a lot of work in Australia, so I always try to get that to my Aussie friends. Um, anyway. So you uh, can't be overly protective and say you never have to swim, and you right. can't be overly so what would I, throw them in the so deep end. So now I'm going to give you a little test. Okay, ready? go ahead. Based on everything we've talked about just so far. Okay. If you happen to have a child whose temperament is in the 10% extreme, mm -hmm. is it? Because kids in the, in the middle 80%, actually, you can't predict anything from their temperament. It's an amazing finding. No, seriously. You have a kid who's in the middle 80%, not extremely outgoing, not extremely shy. They're in the middle. There's nothing that's been found that, as a one-year-old or two-year-old, will predict how they're going to be at seven or eight or nine. Mm. You know, because I'm trying to write this whole piece on adult temperament and everything. In fact, I'm talking about that soon. And, uh, but when you look at the research, and, and Richie Davidson did some beautiful research on this, if you're in the middle of 80%, it's all up in the air. Because mm. so many factors happen, so many things can go on, everything's changing and moving, and, all, and the brain is always reconstructing itself. But if you're at the extremes, either extremes, then you can show their tendency. So what he showed was that in parents who do a certain thing that you're going to tell me how to do, if, is that putting you on the spot too much? No. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go for it. Wrong. All right, so I'm your shy child, which means, just to give you a, a brain interpretation, my right hemisphere, mm -hmm. in, my right upper brain, is always watching for novelty. It communicates direct, directly with my right downstairs brain, which has the amygdala, which creates fear. So whenever mm. my right cortex, my upstairs brain, sees something new, it communicates straight to my downstairs brain, said scared, 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 and then it gets me to withdraw 
and we call that behavioral inhibition. And I'm your son. And what are you, what's happened? Well, we're going to a pool party. Okay. And you don't want to go. I don't want to go, Mom. Mm. And so I could say, um, we said yes two weeks ago that we were going to this party. <laughs> and, if, and if you think one more time, I'm going to say, well, I won't do that, because that yeah. is my left side of my brain yeah. trying to appeal to the left side of your brain. Exactly. Or just trying to freak you Beautiful. out. Beautiful. So that didn't work. That didn't work. You didn't connect. But first. it is my impulse. Because uh, you push my buttons, so that's, you know, because you do this just too many times. Yeah, there you go, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And it's all because you're a bad parent. (laughs) (laughs) And that's because I had a bad parent. (laughs) Tough luck. Work it out on your own time, Mom. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so... Somehow I need to, first of all, uh, do something about the fear that you're feeling because you're uh, paralyzed by Yes, your fear. but look at you the way you phrase That's really interesting. I have to do something about the fear. Yeah, absolutely. That's the big plan. So your left yeah. brain is planning. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a little hint. And probably what I'd want to do is, is, uh, is tune into you. Yes. But I don't want to ask you, tell me why you're afraid. This is the thing. I don't want no. to ask you, tell me because why you're afraid to go swimming. That doesn't seem to be the answer here. Right, because you know me. I'm a shy kid. Yeah. Right. Right. So I would probably, what I would probably, just based on what you just said earlier, is just acknowledge yes. with my eyes and my expression right. and my body and my timing. Oh, yes, good. All your non-verbals. <laughs> Yeah, that you're scared. Now, if my wife sees this, you're, you're all watching. <laughs> but yes. then I would probably offer something like this, where you and I go together and you don't have to swim. Okay, I'll go. Because <laughs> <laughs> what do okay. I care if you swim or so, not? So now, what did, what did I feel? I felt really seen by my mom. Because I'm scared she's going to make me swim. Hmm. And I don't want to go swimming because that's something new. And I don't like doing new things because I have an overactive right pr- frontal region of my brain and it activates my right amygdala. So now you, don't, you, now you know that, but okay, so all right, fine. So now we go to the party. And now we're at the party and I went to the party and I'm like this. <laughs> or more like this. And I say, we're here. That's good. This I know is we're great. here. <laughs> <laughs> then I start getting anxious because all the parents are looking at us. <laughs> and I say, we're having fun. Just go over there. Just go over there. And open, bring your gift. You know, like that. But, right, exactly. but, the, yeah, but the idea is, and this is key, that I, and you've said this a few times in passing, but I, I keep hearing it, that I, as the parent, have to be aware of my own lid flipping. Totally. Because well, go go go. What what were you vulnerable? How would you be vulnerable? In that to moment, like at home, it's easier for me to say, "I'll be the, I'll do the right thing, and I'll get you to the right. pool." But when you get to the pool, you have a lot of other parents there who are looking at you. This is yes. what what you interpret right. it as, as though you're being too soft on this child. They have another idea about how you should be doing this. And they say, well, no wonder the kid won't go in the pool. Look at that mother. She's babying him. Like all of this is, we all know, right? Any of us who are parents, and there are versions of that forever. Okay, so let me do a little thing. Step a little forward. I'm going to get behind you for a second. So I'm going to get inside of this mom's brain. Good luck. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's not nice in there. (laughs) So she was doing a beautiful job of tuning to her shy son, me, over there, right? And, and her right brain is doing a beautiful job of just staying with his feelings. Now, the left brain, remember, is all about going out into the outside world. So the left brain is noticing that everyone is probably saying, oh, you right, about what's going on. And the social display part of this mom's brain, her left brain, is going, this is not right. I've got a five-year-old kid all the other five-year-olds are doing the pool thing. They're giving the presents. All the other kids are doing that. All Probably the other... my husband's fault. <laughs> <Okay. point. laughs> so, so in her left brain, there's a logical analysis going on 
that says the logical parenting move to do is get my son to do what all the other boys and girls are doing. Damn it. Right? Like that. Mm, totally. You know what I'm talking about. So, so now you need to understand the two hemispheres, unfortunately, can fight with each other. Now, there's a book called The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist that basically reviews in 700 pages all of the science of the left-right brain stuff. But one way of summarizing it Good. is actually to just look at Ian's 10-minute video on YouTube. Just type in Ian McGilchrist, and you'll see the whole 700-page book in 10 minutes. It's actually really funny. Um, but the bottom line is that the two hemispheres are compete with each other. So when the left starts getting really strong, like, this isn't the right thing. He should be what doing other kids do. I'm not doing a good job. This is a wrong kind of parenting I'm doing. The right hemisphere doesn't think in right and wrong. It thinks in connection and attunement, vulnerability, you know, being open, mm. sensing how things are. The left is all about what's called the digital hemisphere. It's yes, no, right, wrong, up, down. It categorizes things like that. So at this moment at the pool party, this mom is having this interhemispheric battle. Seriously. And you know what that feels like. Her right hemisphere knows how to be attuned to me. You saw her do it. But you just said, Maria, you just got into this party situation. It freaked me out. And it's a whole, it's freaked you out. It's a whole different dynamic now that happens. Now, unfortunately, if her left hemisphere takes over, what's about to happen? I'm absolutely betrayed by my mom, aren't I? Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm almost going to cry thinking about it. it. You know, if you think about it, I've just I now lost my mom. She yeah. lied to me. Yeah. Yeah. She I did got, not I protect you. me. I tricked you. And now I'm alone in the very place I never wanted to be alone. Mm. Okay. So let's say Maria's red whole brain child and parenting from the inside out, and she's actually holding on to her whole brain. She's not flipping her lid. She's not leaning to the left. She's holding on to both sides. She knows about shyness and the importance of temperament. Temperament's very important, not just attachment. So now let's hear what the proper move would be for the pool experience. When we're at the pool? And I don't want to load you. I can give no, you a No, 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 no. Are you kidding? I'm fine. What, She's what, so what brave. I'm thinking, <laughs> what you must I'm have thinking. a very active left hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, you think? <laughs> what, what I'm thinking is that I might still be having those thoughts, but what I would do yes. is just put my arm around you, because yes. you're probably down there somewhere like this, and just kind of with you, yeah. watch the kids and talk about the kids. That's funny. That's funny. Just, but not make you perform in any way or do right. anything. Just be with you, have fun, and pray to God that someday you'll be out there with them. <laughs> I hear you praying, Mom. That's the problem. That's the problem. <laughs> Why do I have a false sense of self? <laughs> okay. All right. Now. Now, that hug actually reaches right into my right hemisphere because it's a whole body thing going on here. And then, since I said that in Kagan studies, you learned, we all learned, that if you just overprotect me, I will remain anxious. The idea is how to scaffold an expansion mm -hmm. of what a child can feel is tolerable in a tolerable kind of way. So how might we approach the pool experience to give this boy a feeling of safety and connection, but also expanding what's called the zone of proximal mm -hmm. development, is the Vygotsky term. It basically means what I can do with the assistance of a parent or a teacher or some kind of other will allow me to expand what I could do by myself. I move this zone up. Mm -hmm. So what, what should Maria do with me? Go swimming with me, exactly. So the other kids are now eating cake, mm -hmm. giving presents, mm. and she, in her bathing suit, is taking me in the pool. And I'm holding on to her, and I swim away a little bit. I come back, and I swim away a little more. I come back, I swim, and maybe I get some water in my nose. I start to cry. What does she do? Hugs me. Mm. Yeah, that's hard when you get water in your nose. She waits, she waits, she waits, she waits. Then I go cry, swim again because it's fun to swim. Now, if, you're, if I'm in Kagan's study and Maria treats me like this, what am I going to be like by the time I'm 14 or 15 years of age? No signs of shyness whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I become the class president. I become the school president. I'm a rock and roll star on the stage. <laughs> and I'm fine. 
But if you put me in a scanner, you'll still show I have more right hemisphere reactivity than your average bear. But my cortex, because of my mom's communication with me, has grown fibers to soothe my still reactive right hemisphere. That's what he showed. And do you eventually integrate that yourself when your mother's not with you? Of course, no, no, you're gonna stay with me the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, no, no. These are people who go out and do fine. That's what I'm saying. They're, they're indistinguishable in their behaviors and their accomplishments if they've been parented this way, right? So it's name it to tame it, it's connect and redirect. It's all these ways where you understand what is the profile of my child's brain how do I maintain this attuned communication mm. using the fullness of your brain, mm -hmm. your right brain, your left brain, your upstairs, your downstairs brain, and you maintain it this way? 